tells us, Mr. Policeman, please help us. We need your help. Why? Because we brought mess to ourselves by stating there are holes in the narrative, and we have no answer. Right now, all we can do is, Mr. Policeman, please help us. And thanks to God, Mr. Policeman is helping the protected group. They need very much help. Myself, you will not find one lecture of mine about this issue. It should never be brought up in public. And I don't like these idiots, and they are idiots, wallahi, because they're the ones who caused this. In this issue, they're utter idiots who did something haram. And I don't like saying this. This is not something you discuss amongst the masses, ya akhi. It's not wise. You don't understand, Qiraat, let it be. It's wise. That's why I never did it. And that's why even when they accused me, I didn't defend myself because I would rather people have doubt about me than the Quran. Let them throw me off the manhaj, no problem. Believe in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what is happening in the last few years is not me anymore. It's the Western academics. These, these problems are now becoming mainstream. Twitter has so many accounts of Quran experts and they're non-Muslims and they're just saying things. There are books written, yani Brill released a book by Shadi Nasir. Again, yani, uh, read that book as well yani, so, uh, for those that are interested in stuff. And you'll understand that, hey, we need ulama who believe in the Quran to defend the Quran. So the concept of tawatur, which was early on, was not used. There was no one in the early period said that the Quran was mutawatir. That's the later concept that was applied later on on the, on the Quran. Even people like Ibn Mujahid or Tabari, they never used this term to describe the Quran. It was used by the people of Usul al-Fiqh and theologians because you need the Quran. Uh, the Quran is the most important document in Islam. And you derive, you know, it's the first principle, you know, in, in Usul al-Fiqh, the, the first source. And if you don't have an authentic transmitted Quran uh, in all its details, then you have a problem. You have a problem from the premise. And therefore, the idea that the Quran is mutawatir, that it is transmitted uh, to all Muslims, that all Muslims know it in detail, and there's no way that people will conspire or collude on forging or falsifying or transmitting something uh, that is not in the Quran is impossible. Because when you prove something is mutawatir, then it is necessarily obsolete. Uh, even the narratives of the collection of the Quran during the first collection and the second collection, they do, uh, many scholars tackled them and they pointed out, I underlined, you know, in, uh, in the English part, the problematic, uh, historical problematic issues um, in the accounts. And why do people um, uh, try to challenge these accounts? Are they fabricated? Uh, were they later on, you know, written? and people forgot the details. For example, one of the um, interesting parts here is that here, this, this part right here, which in English, you know, it says, for example, when the first collection of the Quran took place, um, the man who was responsible for, who was the head of the committee, uh, again, I mean, put this in parallel with the idea that the Quran was transmitted to everyone and everyone knew all the information or all the Quran and it was mutawatir, as we say. But then in this account, and this account is the official narrative, this is from one of the um, canonical traditions of the, the Bukhari. Okay, so this is the uh, canonical um, account of the transmission of the Quran from the Muslim tradition. It says that um, there were two verses from the Quran that he did not find with anyone else, and they were only with one specific companion. Okay, um, he see the locating the parchments and poems from the uh, memories of man who knew it by heart. And then I found with Khuzayma, that's the name of the person, two verses of, from Surah at tawbah which I had not found with anyone else. Okay? Again, we have to ask ourselves, so why these two men had two verses from the Quran that no one else from the companions of the Prophet had? Okay, so what happened to the idea that the Quran actually was transmitted to everyone and everyone knew the Quran by heart? If we, we are, again, talking here from the Islamic perspective, we are not even going out. So we compare this account with the other accounts from the Islamic tradition, we find contradictions. And what we try to understand is why do we have these contradictions? And which narrative? Is this narrative before the narrative that the Quran is transmitted, you know, to everyone equally? Or it's way the other way around. Or it's a vicious circle and we really can't know which one came before the other. And... Um, 
The other also interesting part of this account is when they collected the Quran. So first, the the only copy was with Abu Bakr, the first caliph, and then the sec the when he died, um, the copy stayed with Omar, the second caliph. But when Omar dies, or when he died, the copy did not go to the third caliph. It went to his daughter, right? And that's also very intriguing because we are talking here about a governmental a constitution which should stay, let's say, in with the caliph. It goes from the first one, the second one, and it goes to the third one. But then when the second one died, it did not go to the third caliph. It went to his daughter, as if the whole matter, you know, transitioned from, you know, a, um, a governmental, if you want, uh, space into individual place. Where why, why the daughter of the caliph would possess this codex and would not pass it or give it to the third caliph, which should be the case. And then if you compare, of course, with the second account, which is what we call the official um, canonization of the text of the Quran during Uthman, Uthman sends a messenger to her and tell her, please give us the copy that you have, okay, and let us copy it down. And this is where the first copying or the first codification of the Quran took place. And then Hafsa, the, she, is, she was the wife also of the Prophet and the daughter of Omar, uh, she sent them the first sheets, they copied it, and they made multiple copies and then uh, he gave it back. Of course, we don't have these sheets of Hafsa or the first codex, they are lost, um, or maybe they never existed. And also there's five different copies that from the time of Uthman, also we don't have access to them. You know, they either never existed or also they were lost. Um, and this is basically a justification of what we call the five different codices. So we have the main codex, which is from Kufa in Iraq. And the second codex is from Basra, also from Iraq. Okay, they are different. They have different. They have differences also in in vocabulary and syntax, etc., and particles. And you have a codex in Mecca. You have a codex in Medina, right? And you have a codex in Dimashq in Syria. So these are the five major codices. And uh, in Kufa, you have one codex, but there are three different readings in Kufa. And this is what makes seven in total. So three from Kufa one from Syria, one from Mecca, one from Medina, and one from Basra, and these are seven. Let me ask you one question to try and make this as specific as possible, I think. If I were to give you a blank mushaf, yeah, and, uh, and tell you to write what is munazzal verbatim from Allah into that mushaf, with no human interference, would you write something which corresponds? It's with not an easy answer. It's not an easy yes or no. It is enough for the Muslim to believe that the I think Quran this should be an easy yes or no, though. Yes or no. I, I have to. Okay, very, very well. So, yeah, Muhammad, after we get on this phone call, me and you, let's have a number of discussions. No problem. I'm very open with advanced students. <laughs> I challenge you, go to France, go to France and wear that. I challenge you, go to France and wear that. What do you think you can challenge? Go to France and wear that. Walk down the Champs Elysees wearing that shirt. That's not your business. Say no more. This is not your business. I am not Mohammed. She's a witch. You are not Muhammad. I'm not Muhammad. Oh, Muhammad is, this, is the bitch. Anti Allah Sayyidina Muhammad. Anti Allah Sayyidina Muhammad. Sayyidina Muhammad. How are you just standing next to the person like this? Are you guys alright, bro? Are you guys alright? Get your camera out of my face, bro. Get your camera out of my face. Get your camera out of my face. How do you stand next to a person like this? How? How? What are you guys, bro? What are you guys? If you care, look. If you care too much about your blood. We don't care about our blood. We'll eat you guys alive, bruv. I swear to God, the day will come. On my mother's life, bruv. Allah will eat you guys alive, bruv. Come on, get out of the park. Get out of the park. Come on. Take her out of the park. Let's go. Can I get that to Can you just move back a bit to give us some room here? Thank you. Get her out of here. Come on, Hector. Let's just get her out of here. Let's 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 get her out of here.
some respect that we have for the Quran. We should. In a Muslim environment, we'll press a little bit and then we'll say, okay, khalas, sami'na wa ta'na. And that's great, alhamdulillah. When you go to academia, they don't have that red line. And they're going to just, you know, the, 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 the famous story of the emperor with no clothes. They just point out, no, that doesn't make any sense. Well, that's not true. And this and that. And they'll bring issues, which I'm not going to mention explicitly, that you know are true because they're in your own books. They're not inventing anything new. They'll bring you riwayat and they'll bring you athar and then you add to that very well-known issues of 
I don't even want to be explicit. And then you bring on top of that makhtutat, and then and then. And it's very clear to you and to every single very advanced student and specialist that the standard narrative has holes in it. The standard narrative does not answer some very pressing questions. Okay, this is what I'm going to say. And but I, I think here we wait, do... wait, wait, let, let me finish this, Emma, because this yeah, is very important. Yeah, right. very, I, I'll let you kind of, let me finish this. And by the way, if you are following online media and articles and whatnot, this is no longer hidden news. More and more professors and academics are writing stuff and it's being publicized on Twitter in the last two, three yeah. years. I have had at least, I'd say, a dozen people tweet at me like specific articles like how do you answer this and you know about ulum al-Quran, about qiraat, about makhtutat, about issues, you know. These are now well known within the Western Academy uh, that they're bringing forth issues. Their level of now knowledge is leaps and bounds above what it used to be, you know, 100 years ago. Now, as for the issue itself, Every single student of knowledge knows who studies ulum al-Quran that the most difficult topics are ahruf and qiraat and the concept of ahruf and the reality of ahruf and the relationship of the Uthmanic mushaf with the ahruf and the preservation of the ahruf. Is it one? Is it three? Is it seven? And the relationship of the qiraat to the ahruf. This is a topic that when you're the beginning, beginning student of knowledge, you're like, what is all of this going on here? When you go a little bit more, you learn to simply memorize what your teachers say and regurgitate it out. And you don't fully comprehend. When you do a deep dive is when things get very, very awkward and difficult. And this isn't new. This is from the time of the Sahaba. In the Sahih or the Hassan Hadith of Bayb al the Hadith of the Ahruf, that when the Prophet mentioned the issue of Ahruf and that there are different Ahruf and whatnot, this is in the version of Muslim Ahmad, Ubayy bin Ka'ab says, authentic Hadith, in my heart, a doubt came that I hadn't had about Islam since the days of Jahiliya. This is not a joke, brothers and sisters. The issue of Ahruf and Qiraat caused confusion to somebody whom the Prophet said, if you want to listen to the Quran directly, listen to Ubay. Ubay is not some even average Sahabi. He is the Qari of the Quran. He is the master. He is who he is. And he goes, what is all of this stuff? Now, for the first time, I'm telling you here, what was the crisis? I mentioned it, referenced it, but I never explicitly said it. Why didn't I say it? Because it should not be said in public. But unfortunately, these brothers, because they released the emails, so then I have to then get, get it. This was the issue. That the issue of ahruf and preservation and qiraat and relationships between them, these are very, very difficult issues. And the most advanced of our scholars they're not quite fully certain how to solve all of the unanswered questions in there. Ibn al-Jazari, who without a doubt is the greatest scholar of Qiraat for the last thousand years. Ibn al-Jazari famously writes, I have been thinking and pondering, oh yes, I've been thinking and pondering about the issue of the Ahruf and Qiraat for over 35 years. Nathan with the yeah. Sana, he said, right? And yeah. confused and whatnot, then finally, this is my response. And by the way, seven, and by the way even that yeah. seven, all later scholars say, well, that doesn't make any sense. So they kind of dismissed even that. After 35 years, the greatest scholar of Qiraat. Some, some accept you know, it. Some accept it. It some, doesn't answer the I've question. Seen, seen some. Anyway, I don't want to get into that issue. Okay. All I am asking, fill the holes. It's been a whole year, whole year with the Holy Quran. What Muslims do is, oh, Mr. Policeman, please help us. We can't answer the basic questions. Please rescue us. And Mr. Policeman comes, yep, they need rescued. But the bottom line is this, Lord Jesus Christ rescued everyone. Yet today they are running away from him. What a disgraceful day for Speaker's Corner. People turn up with their camera. They are quite happy to pr practice their freedom of speech. But I cannot practice my freedom of speech. Why? Because I am asking questions about Islam. Islam is so really, really awful ideology. No one can defend it. All they do is, Mr. Policeman, please defend Islam for us. You know what will happen when Islam takes over? This Mr. Policeman wouldn't be very happy at all. He's not going to...
going to be happy. I'm not going to be happy because my rights, basic human rights, are going to be taken away from me. Because we are turning blind eye and deaf ears at the heart of freedom of speech. Muslims cannot answer the basic question, what happens is, Mr. Policeman, please help us, we need your help. Why? Because we brought mess to ourselves by stating there are holes in the narrative, and we have no answer. Right now, all we can do is, Mr. Policeman, please help us. And thanks to God, Mr. Policeman is helping the protected group. They need very much help. Where we're leaving, bye. That's another issue. Section 29J. Good man.